Welcome back to It's Your Law. Representative Hintz and I are talking about some of the things that have happened during the first six months of Walker Law. And one of the things that uh, really troubled me, because I represent consumers and I care about that particular group especially, uh, they're the people who pay the bills in spite of what the governor says. Uh, they have been robbed on many levels during this first six months. But we have worked so hard to make sure that our insurance companies delivered some of what they promised. And for one example, stacking. If in the typical Wisconsin family you've got three or four cars and you're required and should buy insurance on three or four cars, which includes medical pay and all of the other coverages, you buy five policies or four policies depending on the number of cars you have. And uh, used to be that if you bought five policies, you had five policies. But the governor fixed that in a hurry, didn't he? Yeah, um, right out of the gates, and we had some you know significant changes to uh, consumer rights and individual rights in terms of their ability to uh, take action on behalf of you know themselves. There were some really uh, bills that were introduced, you know, had a quick hearing and passed before you know before before thousands of people went down to the Capitol. Um, look, it's been pretty clear that you know uh, consumer rights and individual rights are not. Um, something that is a priority um, of this administration um, and a lot of the promises that were made by insurance companies uh, you know um, haven't come true in terms of uh, lower premiums and other things um, you know the last legislature was able to address some long-standing issues we were one of two states that didn't require auto insurance um, and both sides had you know supported uh, mandatory auto insurance and so um, that was kept in there but the point is if you're going to have insurance it better mean something in other words there's no point in requiring someone to have an insurance if it's at levels that would cover um, you know injury and other things back in 1970 in other words um, the reality is with health care costs and other things you want to make sure that insurance covers those things um, you know, the insurance industry promised that uh, prices would skyrocket and prices would go back down and prices neither skyrocketed, although they did go up and they certainly haven't gone down now. But, um, you know, I, I think uh, these decisions are not being made in the public's best interest. Um, in other areas, we, you know, I had a bill that protected renters from for uh, when an owner goes into foreclosure. Um, renters we were getting kicked out of their homes within 24 hours through no fault of their own during the last session I was able to get a law passed that gave them uh, two months notice and uh, they um, you know had to be notified uh, that got repealed in the budget so now the bankers can just kick people out of their homes even if it has nothing to do with them um, we saw the payday loan rules that we passed last session get watered down more to allow banks and other financial institutions to enhance payday lending um, you know, again, I don't see what's kind of being done to address some long-standing problems, and there's not really, I guess one of the biggest things that I've had a problem with so far this session is, um, you know, the governor and a lot of other members aren't really answering questions or defending, you know, if you're going to push an idea, you should be out there sort of selling it, defending it, talking about why it's good for the state, why it's good for the economy. You know, presidents on both sides and governors on both sides, normally if they introduce a concept that's either you know, a pretty big deal or pretty radical, they get out on the road and they talk about it and they sell it and they say, this is good for the state because of this. Um, here we are making these substantial changes to consumer protections and consumer law um, and we're not hearing anybody even really defend what they're doing and it makes me think that they don't really want to talk about it. Well, that gets back to how we make sausage and how we make legislation. We need people who are elected. Now that takes money. Uh, they jokingly call the Senate the Millionaires Club, but it's no joke. Uh, even a state race, even a j judicial race that pays around a hundred grand a year, where each side is spending a million and a half or even more, this is about money. Now, if it isn't your money as a candidate, then it's got to be special interest money. And I know that you and Senator Ellis, who is on the other side of the aisle, and many other thoughtful people have felt that we should have some public financing so that everyone with a good idea gets an equal chance of going to the voters and having the same amount of money that the, we can't buy the elections. But I think the first thing that Walker did in that area is he 
just destroyed public financing, didn't it? Yeah, um, right now we have limited public financing, which in the grand scheme of some competitive races may not be that much. It was close to about $8,000 per candidate based on the checkoff that exists on, the, on, your, on your tax form, the voluntary contribution. Um, but that money was all gave you know some first time candidates you know the ability to get started and and to be competitive, um, and at least it was a start that we could have looked at expanding. A lot of people say, oh, you know, I don't want my tax dollars going to support candidates I don't agree with. But when you really look at how decisions are being made, um, looking at you know the two year campaign cycle, um, one way to insulate legislators from um, sort of these kind of you know actions and reactions and influence is, is to, to, you know, put those, put that kind of system in place. And uh, um, we have gone backwards. We got rid of that. We eroded the impartial justice bill, which was I was a sponsor of that um, did allow public financing for our judicial candidates. But, you know, the benefit to legislators would be we wouldn't have to have this reliance on outside money um, and that the public's perception, you know, I think would be cleared up, you know, significantly in terms of you know just who's doing what and what and for what reasons well our united states supreme court which has the same conservative liberal split that we have here in our wisconsin supreme court decided that uh, corporate money was an expression of first amendment freedom of speech that really has uh, opened the door to big business corporate money buying elections buying uh, judicial seats, buying the Senate, which it already owns, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, and buying our government. Uh, it's, it's become the, a kind of a class thing. Uh, we've got the corporate party against uh, the consumer labor party, uh, which is unfortunate because that's a collision and we're all consumers. We all want business to succeed, but we all want our kids to be educated. We want health for our elderly. Uh, and uh, it, it has become a kind of a vicious partisan class war, I think. It has, and you know, historians will look back and say, look, we've always had power by the haves in our system. It's just sort of manifested itself in other ways. But I think if you look at you know, the emergence of sort of the polarized media where you can kind of get the kind of news that reinforces your opinion. Um, you think of some of the bigger things that have been accomplished in this country by government, and I think that, you know, they feel like they'd be almost impossible today. You could never uh, think that great society programs of Lyndon Johnson or New Deal programs of uh, FDR would be able to get done in a world today where, you know, people can be so divided, where the influence of some groups can be so large. and. Uh, you know, it is a different world, and um, you know some of these groups. I think uh, you know do what they're trying to accomplish at their own. Um, you know, maybe impacting themselves. I mean, if our economy is based on consumer demand, and we continue to erode policies that give people the opportunity to get ahead, um, we're not going to have any consumers left in this state and in this country. Um, you can only have so many of the haves um, benefiting, but if there's no have-nots to uh, you know, fill the system, I think it, it's short-sighted. And I think we have to get back to sort of collective good that, you know, certainly respects the individualism of Americans, but also um, fairness, equality, and opportunity. Great ideas. We appreciate you being on the show. I'm going to call Mike Ellis again and see if I can hear the other side next week. Hey, tell him to give me a call. <laughs> I will Thanks. do that. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. In case you've been out of the country for the last six months, we've got a new governor. We have Walker Law and Walker legislation, and it's been an avalanche. A very nice avalanche if you're a big corporation from out of state. A very painful one if you have children you're trying to educate. If you care about the environment. If you can't take another cut and pay at the expense of the rich. And it's a kind of a fight that's ongoing. You pick your side. I have great admiration for a fellow named Mike Ellis, a Republican senator. He, along with all of the other Republicans, voted in lockstep for all of this. Where were you, Mike? Why don't you come here next week and explain it to us? I'm George Curtis. Mm -hmm.